Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking soju. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a strawberry margarita. And in this episode, we have a little bit of a lighter story for everyone. We'll be talking about Action Park, a notorious amusement and water park in New Jersey that is commonly known as one of the most dangerous amusement parks ever built. Action Park opened in May 1978 in Vernon, New Jersey, and was created by Eugene Jean Mulvihill's company, Great American Recreation, or GAR. Jean was a one-time Wall Street businessman with a big personality. The park was at first a way for the company who was using the land for the Vernon Valley ski area in the winter months to make a profit during the summertime. When Action Park opened, it had two water slides and a go-kart track. The next year, the park expanded its offerings to include more water slides, a deep water swimming pool, tennis courts, and a softball field. The park was eventually broken into three sections, the Alpine Center, Water World, and in 1980, Motor World. The entire park was split in half by a highway, and you had to cross a bridge to get from one section to the other. And it had become one of America's earliest modern water parks and had 75 attractions in total. Action Park would become known for its thrilling, unique, and often dangerous rides. Founder Gene Mulvihill wanted guests to be in control of their own ride experiences. Notable attractions included the aforementioned go-karts, which had a speed limit of 20 miles an hour, but employees knew how to rig the vehicles to make them go as fast as possible. The Roaring Rapids, a raft ride that caused everything from fractured femurs, collarbones, and noses to dislocated shoulders and knees. The Surf Hill Racing Slides, where riders would often and crash into each other or be thrown in the air, the diving cliffs where divers would jump 20 feet into a pool with unsuspecting swimmers below, often causing injury, and the super speed boats, which could go 30 to 40 miles an hour and were used as bumper boats by guests. On one occasion, two guests crashed into each other, causing one boat to flip and trap the rider in the swampy, snake-infested water. The most infamous ride at Action Park was the Cannonball Loop, which opened in 1985 and was closed one month later by the Advisory Board on Carnival Amusement Ride Safety. The water slide featured a 360 degree loop, and because of that, if you went down the slide feet first, you'd come out head first and vice versa. Guests had to be hosed down with water before entering the slide. Employees were reportedly given $100 to be the test subjects on the slide, and rumors swirled that test dummies came out of the slide decapitated and dismembered. Andy Mulvihill, Gene's son, claims to be the first live person to test the slide. He told the New York Times that he wore full protective hockey equipment during this ride and that, quote, it was more like a ride you ride to survive than to have fun, end quote. One employee who spoke with a local newspaper shared that the slide caused nosebleeds, lacerations, and back injuries. Padding was added to the loop, and during one inspection, teeth were found in the padding from riders who had hit the padding. During the slide's short lifespan, one rider became stuck, which caused the park to install an emergency hatch. A Navy physician was brought in at one point and found that the riders were experiencing as much as 9 Gs of force as they went through the loop. One of the most popular rides at the park was the Alpine Slide. Though it was called, quote, the safest ride there, end quote, by a park official, one Action Park regular described the slide as, quote, essentially a giant track to rip people's skin off that was disguised as a kid's ride, end quote. According to Weird New Jersey, you sat on a wielded sled and descended down concrete tracks using a handbrake to control your speed. Riders should have been in control of their speed, but the controls often didn't work. Many either had no brake, allowing riders to gain a dangerous amount of speed that would typically result in them crashing through the hell bay barriers, or the brakes would lock, causing the rider to travel slowly before being hit by the person and behind them. The Alpine Slide was responsible for Action Park's first death. On July 8, 1980, 19-year-old George Larson Jr. was riding the Alpine Slide when his sled went off the track. Larson was thrown from the sled into an embankment where his head then hit a rock causing a fatal injury. Larson was alleged to have been an Action Park employee and that the accident took place on a rainy night, but in a 2020 documentary, Class 
Class Action Park, that was proven to not be true. Larson's theft was not reported to the state on the pretext that he was an employee and not a member of the paying public. Larson's family said Malvahill never contacted their family and that park officials blamed the rock Larson had hit his head on for his death and not the Alpine slide. They also believe Larson was riding a broken vehicle. From 1984 to 1985, the Alpine slide reportedly caused 14 fractures and 26 head injuries. The ride would stay open until 1998. Injuries and accidents would only continue from there. The summer of 1982 turned out to be a very deadly season for Action Park. On July 24th, 15-year-old George Lopez drowned in the tidal wave pool. The wave pool was a 100 by 200 feet long and eight feet deep freshwater pool that could hold 500 to 1,000 people. Four large fans forced air into the pool and created waves, which could reach a height of over three feet. The wave pool had murky water, which made it difficult to find swimmers at the bottom of the pool. The wave pool was often overcrowded. Twelve lifeguards, usually teenagers, were on duty at the time and claimed to make 30 saves a day, when a typical community pool would have one to two saves a year. One park official blamed the daily rescues on many park guests coming from urban areas and having few opportunities to swim or even learn how. Regardless, crowded swimming conditions made swimmers bash into each other, the pool walls, and ladders. Some people would sink to the bottom, seemingly unaware that the pool's depth dropped down in level as you moved from one end to the other. The wave pool would go on to be nicknamed the quote-unquote grave pool as it was but eventually claimed two more lives before the end of the decade. On August 1st, 1982, just a week after the first wave pool drowning, another tragedy took place at the park. A 27-year-old man from Long Island, New York, was paddling his kayak on the kayak experience, which was a simulated whitewater course when his kayak tipped over. As he attempted to get back into his kayak, he stepped on a grate that was either in contact with or came too close to a section of live wiring for the underwater water fans that somehow became exposed, and he suffered a severe electric shock which sent him into cardiac arrest. Several other members of his family nearby were also injured. He was rushed to the hospital but later died from cardiac arrest. Park officials denied that the man had suffered electric shock induced cardiac arrest, but the coroner disproved their claims. A wiring issue turned out to be the cause of the incident. The state of New Jersey's Labor Department found that the underwater fan was properly installed and maintained and that no violations of safety laws or amusement ride regulations had occurred. However, it also said that the 19 ampere electrical current found to be flowing through a ground circuit three days after the incident had the possibility to cause bodily harm under certain circumstances. The ride was drained and closed for the investigation and it never reopened. Another attraction that likely led to a park goer's death was the Tarzan swing. This was a steel arch hanging from a 20 foot long cable over a spring fed pool. Patrons waited in long lines for the chance to hang from it, swing out over the water, then jump off as the beam reached its height. In the park's early years, the area patrons jumped off from was not over the water, but over a cushioned area. Some people would let go as soon as they started their swing and then would land on the cushion and then slide or crash into the water. In the mid-1980s, the starting position was shifted so that patrons started over the water. Some patrons hung on too long and scraped their toes on the concrete at the far side of the ride. Others used the ride properly, but then were surprised to find the water underneath was very cold. It was so cold that lifeguards sometimes had to rescue people who were so surprised by the sudden chill that they could not swim out of the pool. In 1984, an unknown man died from a heart attack after jumping from the swing. The water in the natural spring spring was between 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, while a typical swimming pool is between 77 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Several factors contributed to ride safety issues. Since Action Park was one of the first water parks, the ride designers had no formal training or engineering experience and would essentially build rides without knowing how they worked. Therefore, many rides were not properly tested. Ride designers would often come to Gene Mulvihill with a wild idea, and Gene would make the design even more extreme. GAR was also accused of cutting corners to maintain profits, building rides cheaply, sporadically maintaining many of them, and failing to renovate rides to take advantage of later safety improvements to its ideas made by other facilities. 
most Action Park employees were teenagers or in their early 20s and their lack of experience showed, which created a quote-unquote lawlessness among guests. A third of the park was managed by teenagers with little to no management experience. Labor laws were not enforced and the teens as young as 14 could regularly be working over 40 hours a week. Training sessions were held but often not taken seriously by staff. In Class Action Park, one former employee recalled that sessions practicing the rescue of drowning victims were often pretexts for hazing. New hires had to play the drowning victim and after the training was over or instead of training were often abandoned in the water to get out themselves. Safety was generally not their priority and height and weight based restrictions were often ignored. Staff were regularly under the influence on the job and as Weird New Jersey said, quote, chances are your personal safety may have once been in the hands of a 14 year old tripping on acid. End quote. In the Alpine Center area of the park was a shack where staff would regularly go to smoke pot or have sex. Staff were also known to save money they found in the wave pool and throw an after hours end of the year party at the park. At its peak during the early and mid 1980s, Action Park hosted a million guests every year and 12,000 on a busy summer weekend. A former employee shared that on an average day, you could have 50 to 100 injuries and that would double on busy summer days. Another security guard said he saw people get hurt on every ride in the park and that he never rolled anything. The director of a nearby hospital's emergency room claimed then on Action Park's busiest days, there would be five to ten victims of park accident. The most common injuries were cuts, ankle sprains, and contusions from the swimming pools and water slides. They also noted that many injured park guests had alcohol on their breath since the drinking age was not enforced by staff, and quote, beer kiosks were more plentiful than ice cream stands at Action Park, end quote. In response, Action Park brought the township extra ambulances to keep up with the high need. Local law enforcement also claimed a majority of their calls came from Action Park since fights were a common occurrence, likely due to the alcohol sales. This led to Action Park having a reputation for rowdy and quote-unquote criminal clientele. Vernon area residents typically had mixed feelings towards Action Park and Gene Mulvihill. Park officials generally blamed injuries on the guests' actions, saying, quote, many water slide accidents were due to guests who, in blatant violation of an explicitly posted rule, would often discard their mats midway down the slide and wait at a turn for their friends so they could go down together, end quote. And park attendees generally agree that that was the sentiment. Action Park was heavily advertised in Spanish-speaking communities. However, the park had no Spanish translations, which made it difficult for guests and employees to communicate and get safety protocols across. Eventually, the park gained a reputation for people dying and getting seriously injured, which caused attendance to drop. After the 1984 drowning death of 20-year-old Donald DePass and the death of the man on the Tarzan swing, the park began to suffer from legal and financial problems related to their deaths. Mulvihill's philosophy was to never settle and instead force a lengthy and costly trial that the park was sure to win. In 1985, there were 110 reported accidents that caused injury at Action Park. Keep in mind this number only reflects what was reported and there was likely many more injuries that were not reported either to park officials or to the state, which Action Park did eventually get cited for. Despite its numerous accidents, death, and citations for safety violations and allowing minors to operate certain attractions, Action Park was only fined by the state once from 1979 to 1986, leading many to wonder if the park was receiving some type of special treatment. A number of rides would eventually close or be torn down due to costly legal settlements and rising insurance premiums in the 1990s, and the park's attendance began to suffer as a recession early in that decade reduced the number of visitors. In early 1995, GAR operated Vernon Valley, Great Gorge, and Action Park with no liability insurance as it was not required by the state. Financial issues grew, and in 1996, GAR filed for bankruptcy. On June 25, 1997, GAR announced it would no longer operate Action Park. 
A Canadian resort developer bought the property in February 1998 and reopened it that summer as Mountain Creek Water Park. They took a more family-friendly approach and did not serve alcohol. An effort was put forth to distance the park from Action Park and safety became a priority. Jean Mulvihill died in 2012 and in 2014, the area was reopened as Action Park by Andy Mulvihill, Jean's son. They hoped to open a new version of the Cannonball Loop Slide, but that never happened. In 2016, the name changed back to Mountain Creek Water Park and as far as I know, it is still operating under that name today. Though it took the lives of six people, many former guests and employees remember Action Park fondly and are proud to say that they lived through the experience. Getting injured at Action Park was a rite of passage for many children and teenagers from New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. Del, what are your thoughts on Action Park? This is coming from someone who is not a fan of amusement parks or rides or anything like that. And so hearing this, I'm just like, why would you put yourself in danger? just to go on a ride. It doesn't make any sense to me. And to hear that it was like a rite of passage for people who are in my area. Me and Jenny are from New Jersey. It's just a wild thought. I do think that there was a level of special treatment when it came to the penalties that they didn't receive because why wouldn't the state make sure that they were sending a message that they weren't going to accept all these injuries and deaths in this one business. Did the state not see anything wrong with what was happening? It's really disheartening being from New Jersey and hearing that. And hopefully progress has been made in recent years to change that and have more enforcement of the laws that are on the books to protect people, especially when the business has no interest in doing that. What are your thoughts? I find Action Park so fascinating to hear about. If anyone wants to learn more, I would definitely check out the documentary that we mentioned, Class Action Park. It talks to some people that visited the park, people that worked at the park in all levels of like management. It talks to at least one victim's family, someone that died there. And it really gives, I think, the perfect perspective of the park. And they mention this in there that it gets romanticized a lot. It was like a really cool thing to experience. And like, we hated working there when it happened. But I'm glad I made all these friends there. And it was like such a unique experience. But like, I would never let my kids go there now. And the stuff that our parents let us get away with was insane. And I definitely agree. It's like a product of its time for a few different reasons. You know, people would maybe just send their kids off and not necessarily know what they were doing or what Action Park was really all about until it started to gain a reputation. And then throughout the documentary, people do say, you know, Gene Mulvihill could be a great person, but he could really be like a despicable person at the same time too. He really loved not having rules and didn't want to play by anybody's rules. And that's a very frustrating story. He definitely seems like a disgusting person from what I have heard in the documentary, you know, bleeding families dry in order for him to win. So I'm glad it eventually didn't work out. I mean, the one family, um, George Larson's family, he's the one that died on the Alpine slide. His family went as far as to celebrate when Gene Mulvihill died. They opened a bottle of like wine or champagne and celebrated his death because they were so disgusted by the way he and his corporation tried to cover up their son's death. And it's truly awful and I do not blame them at all. And even at the beginning, you know, it's a bit of a lighthearted story, but people really did suffer. Six people died and that's countless people's, you know, lives turned upside down. So it's really hard to ignore that when talking about Action Park. I think it's especially easier for us as people who didn't grow up in the 80s and go to Action Park to not have, you know, like nostalgia for it. Although when I was watching that documentary, I'm not gonna lie, like some of this stuff I was like, man, it sounds kind of fun to work there. Like that would have been like a, a fun experience. I was a very cautious child. I think more so like stemming from my anxiety than anything like my parents really did. But I know I would have been terrified to go on things there. And I am someone that now does like roller coasters and water parks and all that kind of stuff. I can't even imagine, you know, experiencing that as a child. And then like the rowdiness of the crowds too. The sentiment of like, oh, it's a lot of people's own fault for getting hurt is so complicated to me because I've definitely been to water parks where people are frankly fucking around, shocked 
shocking that they didn't get hurt. I think we've all been places, especially teenagers, there's that sense of like, well, how far can we go? What can we do? And people obviously knew at a certain point that there's like no rules here. I can do whatever the hell I want. So yes, I definitely think part of it is the riders, but also part of incidents is Action Park. George Larson, like we said, he hit his head on a rock. In that documentary, his mom had said that the state told Action Park to move those rocks and they didn't, and he died. So that's clearly not his. And we mentioned this before, I think it was on the Saywall Ferry disaster episode. People don't really go into places, especially amusement parks nowadays, thinking like, okay, I need to watch out for my own safety because the ride operators don't care and the park doesn't care. They got a reputation for being dangerous and that's definitely a draw for some people. But, you know, the average person going in, I don't think they should have to fend for themselves for safety or think what's going to happen if I, you know break my leg on this ride or my leg gets cut open on this ride or something like that. Action Park had little regulation and oversight during its tenure. Let's take a look at some modern amusement park standards. Amusement park standards are set by the ASTM International and that stands for American Society for Testing and Materials, as well as the F24 Committee on Amusement Rides and Devices. The group is made up of consumer advocates, government officials, amusement park operators, ride manufacturers, manufacturers, and industry suppliers. They establish standards on design and manufacturing, testing, operation, maintenance, inspection, quality assurance, and more. According to IAPA, the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, quote, these standards undergo frequent review and revision to keep up with new technologies and have been adopted by many governmental jurisdictions, end quote. Amusement park staff follow detailed manufacturer guidelines for inspection and safety, and many parks use outside specialty companies to periodically reinspect rides. These inspections take place on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. States are best equipped to regulate the amusement park industry. Therefore, amusement parks are subject to state and local government codes, requirements, and safety inspections, and must pass rigorous inspections by insurance companies. Currently, 44 out of 50 states regulate amusement parks. The six without state oversight are Alabama, Mississippi, Montana, Nevada, Wyoming, and Utah. These states contain few, if any, amusement parks. There are no federally regulated safety measures for amusement rides that are classified as fixed site, and there are no real national safety standards. The exclusion of fixed site rides from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, or CPSC's, authority is often referred to as the quote-unquote roller coaster loophole and has become quite a controversial issue for safety regulation. When we say fixed site rides or fixed site parks, that means basically anything other than like a moving carnival because they'll, you know, move from site to site. Whereas like Space Mountain at Disney World is never, you know, going to move location. The CPSC collects data on amusement park injuries in the United States, as does IAPA. In 2018, about 11% of theme park injuries were considered serious, requiring hospitalization within 24 hours, according to the IAPA Rise Safety Report. In 2017, the CPSC provided an estimate that 43,405 people had been injured as a result of amusement rides and attractions. In 2017, the age group most affected by theme park injuries were young children ages 5 to 14, accounting for approximately 44% of injuries in 2017. The most common injuries are head, neck, and back injuries from the G-force of rides, slips and falls, cuts, bruises and broken bones, and concussions and other brain injuries. Death at a theme park is extremely rare, and on average, there are about four per year across the country. Del, what are your thoughts on either the safety standards or the statistics of injury, and does it make you, as someone that's not really into amusement parks, does it make you scared to go to them? So I'm not someone that likes to take a lot of risks. I'm not someone that is like a thrill seeker. Yeah, amusement parks are not my thing. Like I said before, I definitely understand the appeal, but it's just not something that I think is worth the risk. And when it comes to the roller coaster loophole, I think it's definitely a very strange thing that you wouldn't have a federal oversight of something that is dangerous. You have a situation where you can go to one state and be perfect 
perfectly fine at an amusement park. And then that same person can go to another state and be seriously injured. And I don't think that's okay. What about you? I do agree that there should be some type of federal oversight, like regulation wise, even if it is the federal government, just like signing off on these other committees saying like, yes, we do agree. And, you know, we'll help to ensure that these rules get followed. I think that would probably make a big difference. Exactly what you said. When people are left to like their own devices, there's no oversight and bad things can happen. Action Park, prime example. It doesn't really make me scared to go to amusement parks. I will say I do draw the line on some rides in some places. Like I don't go to carnivals. I don't trust carnival rides. The Jersey Shore can be a little infamous for not having the safest ride. So I do not mess around with that. I do like to go to Disney World and Universal. I do trust those rides a little more. But I will also say they probably have more money to spend too on, you know, staff and maintenance and technology to uphold these standards. And also they have more of a reputation than like something like a Six Flags. And I don't know about you, but I feel like Six Flags does have a a similar reputation to Action Park almost, especially with like crowd rowdiness and the little bit of danger on the rides. We wanted to now mention a few more modern theme park accidents and maybe some more notorious rides and theme park and water parks. The first one we'll be talking about is Schlitterbahn. One of the most recent tragedies that took place at an amusement park or water park was at the Schlitterbahn Water Park in Kansas City, Kansas on the now closed Verrucht water slide. Verrucht was 168 feet tall, making it the tallest water slide in the world. Riders would descend the steep 17-story drop in a raft, propel up a five-story hill, and back down again. Rafts held three riders, and riders were weighed at the bottom and top of the ride to ensure that they met a weight limit. A majority of the slide was covered by metal hoops that supported netting, which was put in place so rafts and riders would not fly off. On board, riders could reach speeds of up to 70 miles an hour. The ride was designed at the park by John Shuley with assistance from park co-owner Jeff Henry. Henry pressed his design team to complete the ride at a faster pace than usual. Many staff worked almost around the clock. Calculations that were normally allotted three to six months instead had five weeks to be completed. As they began testing, rafts kept going airborne on the ride's large bottom hump. A safety consultant hired by the park shortly before Verruck's scheduled opening told Henry it was unfinished and unsafe. When complete, he recommended that only riders aged 16 and over be allowed to ride. Henry, who had no formal engineering training, decided age 14 was better. Just before the opening, however, he dropped any age limit. Between the slide's opening and August 2016, numerous riders reported various injuries from the slide, including concussions, slipped spinal discs, and facial abrasions. One lifeguard would later claim that a park lawyer intimidated him into covering up a more serious injury a guest received on the ride. On August 7th, 2016, Caleb Schwab, the 10-year-old son of Kansas State Representative Scott Schwab, died while riding Verrucht. The raft he was riding went airborne during the ascent of the second hump and impacted a metal support of the netting, decapitating Caleb. Caleb was riding with two women who were also injured in the incident. Reportedly, Caleb, who weighed 74 pounds, had been allowed to sit in the front of the raft rather than in between the two women accompanying him. Him, thus creating an uneven weight distribution, which some experts concluded may have contributed to the raft going airborne. It was later found out that the raft Caleb was in, raft B, was known for going off track and reaching a higher speed than other rafts. Park operation managers received 17 separate staff reports during the 2015 and 2016 summer seasons about how RAF B required maintenance, including five from that week alone. Engineers who inspected the ride also commented that the ride's netting used in areas where riders traveled up to 70 miles per hour, quote, pulls its own hazard because a rider moving at high speeds could easily lose a limb if they hit it, end quote. Their findings revealed that the use of the metal brace and netting system in the design, along with the use of hook and loop straps to restrain the riders, violated guidelines set by the 
ASTM F24 Committee on Amusement, Ride, and Devices. Kansas State legislators voted to change the law that had allowed Slitterbond to self-inspect, requiring that all the state's amusement park attractions to be regularly inspected by the state. The Swab family settled with several involved parties, including Slitterbond, for approximately $20 million in early 2017. On March 23rd, 2018, a grand jury issued an indictment against Slitterbond and its former director of operations, charging them with involuntary manslaughter, aggravated battery, aggravated child endangerment, and interference with law enforcement. The indictment the indictment accused the park of negligence, concealing design flaws, and downplaying the severity of previous injuries reported on the ride. The 2018 indictment against Litterbond wrote that Henry and Schooley, quote, lack technical expertise to design a properly functioning water slide, end quote, and did not operate standard engineering procedures or calculations on how the ride would operate. Instead, they used quote-unquote crude trial and error methods to test its performance out of haste to launch the ride. On February 22, 2019, criminal charges were dismissed against Henry, Gooley, and Miles due to the fact that inadmissible evidence had been presented to the grand jury. The last park we'll talk about is Rye Playland. Rye Playland in Rye, New York has experienced a number of accidents that led to several deaths during its almost 100-year history. In 1938, a 19-year-old man was killed after being ejected while riding the whip. In 1984, six people were taken to the hospital after sustaining injuries when ride vehicles collided on the Wild Mouth roller coaster. A mechanical failure was blamed for the incident. In 1988, an eight-year-old girl choked to death on a piece of gum that became lodged in her throat while riding the Dragon roller coaster. In 2004, a seven-year-old girl was riding the Mind Scrambler, a spider-armed spinning attraction, when she wriggled free of the restraining bar on one of the cars, knelt on the seat, and fell to her death soon after the ride started. The park was not cited for any violations or required to make improvements to the ride after the girl's death but officials announced plans to add seatbelts, more lighting, and a second attendant at the mine scrambler. Then in 2007, a park employee, 21-year-old Gabriella Garin, was also killed on the mine scrambler. Garin was fastening some late arriving riders into their seats. While she was helping the riders, another ride operator started the attraction. Garin was thrown from the ride and killed. Park officials acknowledged that a safety precaution put in place after the 2004 accident on the ride had not been followed. The mine scrambler permanently closed after Garen's death in 2007. In August 2005, seven-year-old John Kelly Kassara died while riding the Ye Old Mill boat ride. He was riding alone on the slow-moving boat ride when he exited his boat and became trapped under the boat. Kassara was found an hour later. His head had been crushed by the conveyor belt. It's believed he got scared during the ride and exited his vehicle. His parents sued Westchester County government for negligence. Rye Playland is the only county-owned amusement park in the United States which has caused controversy in itself. Their lawyers interviewed witnesses who made claims of lack of ride operator training and lack of management oversight. Their case was settled in three days. Playland's former director testified saying that if Playland Leland had followed its policies, the incident would have never occurred. The old mill ride should have never been open that day because the ride did not have enough employees on hand and of the employees working on the ride, none had a valid license to operate it. He also admitted that extra employees who were in charge of monitoring riders while on board Ye Old Mill were cut from the ride and that surveillance cameras within the ride were pointed at the animatronics and scenery instead of the riders. It was also discovered that no ride operators or ride managers knew how to place an emergency stop on the ride. Safety precautions were added to the ride and stricter staff training was put in 
in place following Kansara's death. In 2006, a 43-year-old woman drowned after walking into a man-made lake that was off-limits to swimmers. An autopsy showed that she had a blood alcohol level that was seven times the legal limit. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Action Park. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the Manson family. As always, stay safe.